Church's one foundation is Jesus Christ the Lord. She is the We begin in the name of the only true God, the triune God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. Most merciful God, Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us, and it is for his sake he forgives all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of God's word, I announce his grace to each of you. And in the stead and by the command of Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is Good, and call upon his name. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Glory to his holy name. Seek the Lord and his strength. 
remember the wondrous works that he has done. O offspring of Abraham, his servant. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. All give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast. The Lord be with each of you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love that receiving what you have promised, we may love what you have commanded. We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You would please be seated. Robert. The first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possessions. The Lord did not set his affection on you and chose you because you were more numerous than other people, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of the Pharaoh <laughs> king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. 
This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. The epistle is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called those he called. He also justified those he justified. He also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charges against those whom God had chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is that condemned? Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or phantom, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creations will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The gospel for this Sunday is recorded in Matthew chapter 13. It begins with verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls when he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had, and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on shore. Then they sat down and they collected the good fish in baskets and threw away the bad. Now this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angel will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? And they said, yes. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us together confess our faith through the words of the creed as we find it in our handout. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, was died also for us under Pontius Pilate, and very, they arose again from the scriptures and the right hand of God. His kingdom will have no end. God, 
resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated and let us sing Built on the Rock. God's grace and his peace be with each of you this day through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, Gwen asked me if I was cold. No, I am not cold. But I got to tell you, I am hot. I wore this for my sister-in-law. She was marveling at how many different outfits I seem to have. 
Well, this is another one. Uh, and Gwen goes, you know, I've never seen that one before. And uh, he's right. I haven't really worn this one before. Uh, this is a chasuble. And I wear it as a, 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 an, almost like a, a surplus. And so I wore it for her. Now I wish I didn't because I'm sweating. But, uh, but those who do not know Christ, they should be the ones that are sweating because, believe me, it is going to get hot for them. Jesus, in this part of Matthew, explains three parables to us. Now, the kingdom of God has two specific aspects. The kingdom of grace here on earth, that's the church. And the kingdom of glory, that's the church in heaven. All those who have died in Christ. The door to the kingdom of God is the gospel. Without the gospel, there is no salvation. Now, I'm going to say that again. Without the gospel, there is no salvation. This feel-good religion that we hear today is not the gospel. What's preached by the smiling pastor in Houston is not the gospel. I actually heard him the other day refuse to admit that there's a hell. He refused to talk about sin and grace. He basically said that's not the way he does things. He has the largest church right now in the whole country. And they do not hear about the fact that they are sinners in need of the gospel of grace so that through faith in Jesus Christ, they will be saved. He even went so far as to say that even those that we may think are atheists, they're good people and they'll get to heaven too. But not just him. There are about 30 of them around the country that emulate him. It's not Jesus, though. It's really strange that the most scary part of judgment and suffering comes from the mouth of Christ himself. But that's not his purpose. His purpose is not that you be condemned. He didn't come for that. He came that you may believe and be saved. And John points out that the only reason you're going to go to hell is not because of your sin, but because of your unbelief. Anyone who says he does not sin makes God out to be a liar. And the truth isn't in him. Jesus came to die for you. He died for the sin that you committed so that you could find pardon through the gospel and have the door to heaven opened up to you. God showed his love for you, not his wrath. And Jesus wants you to understand that. He wants you to know that through his love, he gave his life because of your sin, which condemns you through unbelief. It is your unbelief that opens the door to hell. Your sins have been forgiven. Christ died once for all. And so, knowing this was going to take place, Jesus tells three specific stories to the crowd that he's speaking to. Everything, though, 
about the kingdom of God hinges on the gospel. Without the gospel, as I said, there's no kingdom of God for any of us. Because it is through the gospel that God promised us forgiveness, salvation, and everlasting life. And it's through the gospel that we become citizens of heaven. Okay, so the first parable, the first story that he tells, is about an individual who's not a very nice person. He discovers this treasure in a man's field. And he buries it. And he goes and sells all that he had to buy this field from the man who did not realize there was a treasure in his field. This treasure was found by a less than honorable man. He conceals it. He cheats the landowner. All he cares about is obtaining it, even if it means being unethical. Why? Because he desires that wealth. Jesus tells us this kind of man would sell his property, everything that he had, to buy the field. Now, the conduct of the man would be and is dishonest. Morality demands that he should go to the landowner and tell him about the treasure that was in his field. But because of his sinful nature, he endeavors to gain the property by trickery and pay less than what its value truly was. Nowhere is Christ justifying his conduct. He merely states the way it is with people who want to gain wealth or position or power the easiest way dishonestly. I was watching, and I got to be careful, I'll spell it, because in Rhode Island, I always, we, we add R's to things, okay? P-A-W-N, okay? P-A-W-N, stars. And this young man brought in a coin. And if I remember right, he was given it as a, a payment for a gambling debt. And he wanted $1,000 for it. Well, one of the, unfortunately like me, portly uh, sales clerks, the young ones, refused, wanted to give him less. And then he got up to $500, and the guy still refused. So he called in Rick Harrison. Well, Rick looked at the coin and the young clerk said he wants a thousand. I've offered him five. Rick looks at the coin and goes, no way. Because I think this coin is worth a lot more than that. So they called in an expert. The expert told the young man that the coin was worth somewhere at auction, at a good auction, maybe as much as $10,000. Well, Rick's a businessman. He was ethical. He was honest. And that's the way the landowner should have been treated by the man who discovered the treasure. Rick ended up paying him, I believe it was $5,500. He has to make a profit. He doesn't know how much he can sell the coin for. Just because it might sell for 10 doesn't mean it will. Well, the young man settled for that. Honesty paid off. Some people have said, well, Jesus must be condoning his actions because he uses it in the parable. No, Jesus is just stating the case that this man had so much zeal for that treasure that he was willing to do anything to get his hands on it. Now, the teaching of the parable is this. 
The kingdom of God is a treasure worth doing anything you can to receive. The way that you enter the kingdom of God is through the gospel. And you should be willing to give your very life for that gospel. We should do anything and everything ethically, morally, to gain that gift of righteousness which offers us forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel message that opens the door to heaven is more valuable than silver and gold. In Psalms it says this, what God has for us is more precious than gold, much pure gold. It's sweeter than honey even that which is in the honeycomb. And in Proverbs 3, it says about the wisdom, and wisdom is to know God. To know God can only come through the gospel. God is more profitable, the kingdom of God, than silver or gold. You see, silver and gold cannot buy your salvation. Your salvation has been won for you. And the grace that offers you that kingdom comes through God's gift and you receive that gift through faith. When a person hears the message of salvation in Christ and believes it is his or her duty to sacrifice all that hinders it becoming obtained, and they should strive, they should be determined to seek all of it with as much zeal as an unbeliever will seek wealth in this world. It's we who should be striving with God. Now, the truth of the gospel always isn't plain. We talked about it this morning in the Bible class. We looked at several things that you might think the Scripture says. But when we dug into the Scripture, we found out that that's not actually what the Scripture is teaching. Just because people say it is doesn't mean God says it is. And just as they had to dig for that treasure you have to dig into the Word of God, into the Gospel, to discover the treasure that God has for you. And then to sacrifice anything that gets in its way to gain that blessed faith that receives the gift of God's grace. Paul said in, in Philippians, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness in knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. You see, Christ was more to Paul than his own life. And actually, he gave his life up for Christ. I consider them, he said, all this earthly stuff that I might have as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Why? Because I don't have my own righteousness. My righteousness is as filthy rags, basically. But to gain the righteousness of Christ is what I should cherish the most. The righteousness that comes from God and is received by faith. Okay, then Jesus goes on to tell a second parable. Now, this parable is about a man who thought he could find happiness and joy if he could discover a fabulous pearl. And he sought this joy and happiness for many, many years in an earthly object. And then he found it. 
at least what he thought was it. And he went and he sold everything he had. All his security was put aside. All his possessions sold in order to gain enough wealth to buy that one pearl of value. You know, there are many people like him. Many people who seek happiness in worldly things. And they're disappointed. They seek happiness in relationships. And relationships don't last. They seek happiness in possessions. And possessions don't last. But I was listening to someone the other day that was hawking um, gold. And, oh, if you want to be happy, if you want to have wealth, you need to invest in gold because the dollar's going to collapse. If the dollar collapses, how are they going to spend the gold? To spend gold, you have to turn it in to be assayed to find out what its true value is. Well, you can't take it to the grocery store, so it's no good. If it's worth $1,700 an ounce, how is that grocery store going to give you change when the bill is only 85 bucks? They can't. So you can't spend that gold. I don't care what they say. Happiness isn't in things. But as people seek that happiness, many of them turn to God's word and they find the gospel. They find that gateway to heaven. They find true happiness in the gospel, which is the pearl of great price. The meaning here is that we all want happiness. We all want joy in our life. We all look for that which is going to bless us. People seek it, but if they're seeking it in the world, they're never going to find it. But in the gospel, there is what truly gives hope and joy and peace for each and every one of us. And as Christians, as followers of Christ, we should remember that Christ sacrificed everything, his own life in order to earn for us what truly brings us joy, knowing that we have a place in heaven forever. And in turn, we should be willing to sacrifice everything that we are, everything that we have for Christ. You know, pearls are truly valuable because of their beauty and their rarity. And the value of a pearl increases with color, shape, and size. But you have to go through a lot of oysters to find that pearl of grace price. And you may not ever find it. The meaning of this parable is almost the same as the first one. It's designed to represent the gospel as of more value than anything else that exists and to impress on us that faith in its promise should move us to dutifully sacrifice all that we possess for Christ. And then lastly... He says that the kingdom of God is like a fishing net that's thrown out into the lake. Now, we've got to remember that the Sea of Galilee is a lake. It's not an ocean, okay? Well, the net is thrown out. The net represents the gospel. And on the day of the Lord the last day, the day of judgment, and there will be a day of judgment. That net is going to be pulled in and brought to shore. And it's going to be emptied. That which is good will be separated from that which is bad, the fish. And the fish represent people. 
The good are those who believe, and the bad or the evil are those who reject the love and the grace that God, our Heavenly Father, offers to everybody. Everybody has the opportunity to hear God's promise to them and believe. But there are those who just refuse to believe. When Jesus died, all were redeemed. But redemption only benefits those who believe. The scripture says Christ didn't come into the world to condemn the world, that's John, but came to save it. And all those who believe in Christ will be saved. But those who reject Christ will be lost, not because they don't have forgiveness, but because they don't believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God, Jesus. If you want a place in the kingdom of God, believe. Now, Jesus never fails to keep us mindful of the truth that there is going to be a day of judgment. Jesus came to offer salvation to all of those who believe and all of those who believe benefit from the gospel, and they will be saved. It's really strange, though, that so many of these false preachers on YouTube I like the smiling preacher down in Houston who believe that no one's going to go to hell. All will be saved. Who reject sin and grace. We all have got good in us. Surely we wouldn't go to hell. Yet as I said when we started, the most damning and frightening accounts of hell and the suffering that takes place there doesn't come from me or you or any other preacher. It comes from Jesus himself. Jesus is the one that said that the unbeliever is going to be cast out. I'm just mimicking him. A parrot doesn't speak of itself. It mimics what you teach it to say. We don't speak for ourselves. We mimic Christ. Jesus said that the just, the believer, will live by faith. The unbeliever rejects that faith, rejects the gift, rejects the love and the mercy of God. And because of that, they will be lost. But you who believe, the kingdom of God is open to you through the gospel, and you have everlasting life. Now may the peace of God, which certainly, certainly surpasses understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. And amen. I'm going to ask our good usher, our ushers, if they would, I believe we're going to have uh, the offering right now. Are we Lutherans? Are we Christians? Yes. Oh, then there's an offering. <laughs> I was listening to this one guy, and this is how bad it gets. His name is T.J. Jakes. And I can use his name because he openly does this on TV. He said that because he wants, he demands that God give him a blessing and so if he wants a great blessing, he gives a great gift and demands that God fulfill his promise to multiply that gift. I haven't found that in the Bible yet. but And um, he was telling them that if they want a great gift, to give greatly. I'm not going to tell you that. God will put it on your heart what you are to give. Not me. And don't give expecting to get more back. 
that's a fallacy. I know people that have given much and gone bankrupt. I've heard them say that God doesn't want paupers in his church. But what did Jesus say? That who will always be with us? The poor. We give to God to support our church, not to get rich. If you would, please rise for prayer. God of grace, we thank you for all that you have given to us, for the blessings that we have, for the joy and the peace that come through the gospel, for the kingdom that we are part of. Continue to help us to grow in your grace and in our faith. May it ever hold fast to the blessed hope of everlasting life in Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah. And Lord, it's unfortunate that there are those who pervert your gospel, who pretend to be preachers of the truth, yet they don't preach Christ crucified, for the sins of the world. They don't preach Christ resurrected for hope of everlasting life. They don't point us to our own nature to confess our sin and trust in Jesus. Lord, help our pastors in our church to be ever faithful to the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, for our shut-ins, for Jean and Gerald, bless and keep them in your care, Lord, for our nation, as it again is being split apart, bring unity to it, but that unity can only come through hope in Christ. Be with our, our sick and ailing, with Brent with Steve, with Billy, with Cooper, with Brian and Linda. Preserve them, Lord, in your grace and lift them up. Place your hand upon them. Be with Susan and Sandy. Lord, strengthen and preserve them. For Susan and for Sandy's husband, who's in hospice. Place your hand of healing on Susan and relief on Sandra, on, on Sandy and her husband. Lord, in your mercy, for Isabel and Joan who celebrate birthdays, oh, today. We know that Isabel is 16 and we'll leave it at that. Lord, bless them and keep them and strengthen them. We ask that you be with our military members, that you make a blessing for them. For Austin and Brittany, it's not easy for a husband and a wife both to serve, but bless them in their service. We ask that you would be with Marcus and also with Nicholas as they serve as well. Strengthen and preserve them, Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all of those for whom we pray, trusting in your grace and praying that prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, In that night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he gave it to them. He said, take and eat of it, all of you. For this is my body given for you. In the same manner, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it to them and he said, take and drink you all of it. 
For this cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do, remembering everything that I have done for you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Come, for all is prepared. Take and eat. For this is the true body of Christ. Take and drink. Take and drink. For this is the blood of Christ. Now, may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Go in the peace of the Lord and serve him. Come, take and eat, for this is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for all of our sins. Take and eat, for this is the body of Christ. Take and eat, for this is the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for all of our sins. Take and drink, for this is the blood of Christ, shed for you at Calvary. Take and drink, for this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for us on the cross for the forgiveness of all of our sins. Take and drink the blood of Christ. Now, May this true body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in true faith until life everlasting. Go in his peace and serve him. For this is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for all of our sins.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Go in the peace of the Lord and serve him. Yep. Take and eat, for this is the body of Christ. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace and serve him. If you would, please rise for the blessing. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his everlasting peace. Please be seated and let us close with our final hymn.